Ugh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second annual video game tier list. I guess this is officially a tradition now, so hooray for that. Uh, this is the video where I start by asking questions like, how should an objectively bad game that I had fun playing rank against an objectively better game that I didn't enjoy as much? Or how does a game that's consistent but not very innovative compare to a game that takes more risks while occasionally missing the mark? And then I end up losing my mind because I just tried to compare Microsoft Flight Simulator to Peggle 2. This list is not limited to games that came out in 2022, just games I played for the first time in 2022. We'll be using my patented six tier system and obviously Obviously, since this is my tier list, that means this is my opinion, which is objectively better than yours, and anyone who tries to argue with me in the comments below is a plebeian fool. Anyways, here are the games I played in 2022. For many, the Dirt games are great Simcade rally racers, which to me makes it all the more baffling as to why Codemasters decided to suddenly change lanes with this game. Dirt 5 is a full-on arcade racer, and... Not, not a very good one. It tries to take a step in a new direction while also keeping a foot planted in what made the old Dirt games fun, and the result is that it fell down. It's an arcade racer with nothing new to offer. It's unable to set itself apart from others in its genre and has far too much content locked behind paywalls. Codemasters, please figure out what you want to do with this series because I, for one, would hate to see it go to pieces. Being one of those weird golf game fans, I was equally excited and skeptical when this game was announced. I was well aware of Camelot's recent track record for Mario sports titles, but I was hoping that this game would be different, coming with plenty of unique game modes, characters, power-ups, and courses. And then this game came out and it said, how dare you have expectations? I had fun with this game, sure, but the lack of content holds it back way too much for me to consider it anywhere near good. It's far from the best party game on Switch, and overall, I doubt it's a game most people will get a ton of hours out of. But it is better than this garbage. Ubisoft must have really liked the first Assassin's Creed game because they only decided to make it nine times. And with that in mind, it's honestly a miracle they were still getting the review scores they were. Origins was the long overdue shakeup to the Assassin's Creed formula that the series had so desperately needed. I'd say the changes made to stealth, parkour, and combat are definitely for the better, and combined with a large open world, it's certainly enough to make Origins feel like a new Assassin's Creed game, but in general, everything still feels a bit too sluggish and slow for my liking. It's a good new formula for the series, but the game really lacks that extra bit of polish that I'd really like to see. Also, the story is ass. It's been a while since I've played a good arcade aerial combat game. It's still been a while since I've played a good arcade aerial combat game. Aces of the Sky has a very repetitive gameplay loop. There's not a lot to do other than fly through rings and shoot down planes, plus the occasional bombing mission, all of which is taking place in nearly identical maps. It's definitely more impressive in its presentation than it is gameplay-wise. The story mode has this comic book motif, which matches up well with the game's cartoony art style. It's a cool aesthetic, even though it doesn't really save the game too much. I had such high hopes for this game. Maybe, maybe a little too high. Like several others in D tier, Hot Wheels Unleashed feels very bare bones and repetitive at its core. The fairly sound racing is betrayed by the general lack of track themes, which the developers decided to remedy by adding excessive amounts of DLC, which is pretty overpriced if you ask me. I will admit that the collecting aspect of the game is kind of fun, and the level of detail put into the cars is actually quite impressive. But overall, unless you're really into the customization aspect of the game, uh, designing liveries, building tracks, that sort of thing, I can't see the game having much value for most people. I won't pretend to be an authority on Overwatch, but in my opinion, Overwatch 2 is possibly the laziest AAA title to come out this year. Now, is it fun? Well, well yeah. It's, it's Overwatch, but therein lies the problem. It's just Overwatch, except now it's 5v5, so I guess technically there's even less content. Little was changed from the base game, and therefore little was fixed. Even the co-op mode that Blizzard was pushing so hard ended up getting delayed to 2023. In the end, it feels like the boldest part about this game is the fact that Blizzard dared call it a sequel. This is a Dark Souls clone. 
I really wanted to like this game, and the fact that it's technically canon is really cool, but to be completely honest, I spent way more time being annoyed than entertained. Like I said, this is a Dark Souls clone with some nice presentation. I mean, it is Star Wars after all. But that's about it. Weightless, unsatisfying combat, excessive platforming, consistent bugs, and a plethora of entirely useless collectibles are the biggest plagues in this game. At least BD1 is cute. Aw, look at him. Oh boy, the future is here and it runs like piss. Ruff doesn't even begin to cut it. This is just bad. Frame drops pop in, gross textures, camera glitches. Scarlet and Violet are far more janky to play than they deserve to be. It's clear that Game Freak has no idea how to optimize this new style of Pokemon, which sucks because the rest of the game is actually really good. Open world Pokemon is such a great idea and these games nail it. Like the world, the music, the characters, the character models, there's so much to love, but when the rest of the game runs like this, who cares? Game Freak, get your shit together, figure out how to optimize your games, and then you'll have a really solid title on your hands. Oh, you bet your ass I played the cat game. Stray got big because it excels at replicating that weird slinky dexterity that cats have. Y you know what I'm talking about. That plus the emphasis on presentation and sound design make this game look and feel very lifelike. Unfortunately, it feels like it's only the presentation which has received attention since by comparison, the story and gameplay feel like afterthoughts. Controlling a cat is cool, but when constant bugs and text blurbs and cut corners throw you out of the immersion, the experience is somewhat lessened. It's certainly novel, but novelty alone isn't enough to offset Stray's more fundamental issues. Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion I mean, with a title like that, you know it's gonna be good. This is a very cute adventure game with decent graphics, music, and gameplay mechanics. It's also not very long or difficult, and I beat it in a single sitting. And that's really all there is to say. It's a fun game, I just wanted more of it. Do you remember five seconds ago when I said Turnip Boy was cute and fun, but also painfully short and I wanted more? Yep. Sniper Elite 5 was so close to being really good. It plays like a weird blend of Hitman and Ghost Recon. It combines stealth and action gameplay in large, fairly open-ended levels. You don't have as much freedom here as you do in its contemporaries, but I was too busy seeing what absolute abomination of weapons I could come up with to care all that much. Ultimately though, this game is severely held back by that lack of freedom, as well as clunky controls and the fact that it's got more bugs than a mattress at your local Super 8. It's a shame that a game which is ultimately pretty fun at its core is so deeply stained by things that could have been pretty easily fixed if it had just been playtested a bit more. Deathloop is a strange one. Not only is this a shooter where the entire game is also one giant puzzle, uh, figuring out when, where, and how to eliminate your targets, but technically it was also released by Xbox to be an exclusive for PlayStation. Huh. The story, uh, well, well, it exists. As a Bethesda game, there's a bit too much reading for my liking, but at least the gameplay is sound. Gunplay feels excellent, nailing those headshots is super satisfying. Controls take a minute to get used to, but the variety of power-ups available means the game is very open to experimentation in terms of how you can move around and eliminate enemies. It's a solid game, frustrating at times, but overall, it's an experience I enjoy. As an RPG, West of Loathing doesn't have too much going for it. Actually, in terms of gameplay, it's only painfully average at best. But that is something you will completely forget about once you get immersed in how absolutely ridiculous this game is. This game has weaponized its unpredictability. You never know what it's going to throw at you, and that's what I love most about it. No other game is going to ask you to manage a railroad company, rob a graveyard for people named Dave, stop a necromancer cult from taking over the world, and deliver mail in a single sitting. It has ridiculous dialogue, stupid features, and a wordplay so clever you'd think it was written by Mel Brooks. Hey guys, look, it's a trading post. Get it? It's, it's a trading post. Play this game. 
let this sink in for a second. Okay, you ready? Game Freak made a good video game. Compared to Scarlet and Violet, Legends Arceus does feel more like a prototype than a proper Pokemon experience, but it's still a good time. This game is constantly shoving you forward as if to say, get on with it already. Getting into and out of battles is much faster, as are battles themselves, and catching Pokemon is so quick and easy that there is no incentive to not fling a Pokeball at everything you see. It brings a lot of new ideas to Pokemon, an open world, stealth, battle styles, inventory management, which doesn't sound all that exciting, but, but, but it is. It's a refreshing change of pace for the series, rough around the edges certainly, but overall, a step in the right direction. Psychonauts is not an easy game to play nowadays, mostly because parts of it have aged about as well as fine milk. The controls are wonky at best, and in the late stages of the game they blend with poor level design to become near intolerable. There's also lots of backtracking required, and by now I'm sure you've noticed the graphics. But despite some low lows, this game has some equally high highs, namely its story and art direction. There's so much whimsy and creativity packed into this game and its world, it's crazy how well-realized abstract concepts like thoughts, fears, and even mental disorders have been depicted here. It may not have sold well at the time, but with its creativity and humor, it was always destined to be a cult classic. I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. There's really no game quite like it. Except for the sequel, that one's, that one's actually pretty similar. Remember slightly more than five seconds ago when I said that Psychonauts is not an easy game to play nowadays? You do? Okay, well, Psychonauts 2 takes the elements from the first game that age poorly and just... Thanos snaps them into oblivion. Fantastic controls, no more backtracking, and buttery smooth animation are at the forefront of what this game has to offer. Psychonauts discuss mental disorders to an extent, but here it's become the main focus of the game, and not only have these topics been handled with much more tact, but once again they are wonderfully realized through bright, beautiful, and often psychedelic landscapes. Ultimately, this is a game about mental health, healing, recovery, and self-care, and I think that's really neat. Almost as neat as Raz's new drip. He do be looking kind of fresh, though. Ghost of Tsushima is the most fun I've had with an open world game since Breath of the Wild. I'm serious. Now, I wouldn't say it's as good as Breath of the Wild, but I can confirm that it is, in fact, a pretty fun game for two main reasons. Firstly is the world, which is absolutely beautiful, and I don't just mean visually. It's very large and very full, but it never feels bloated. In fact, finding all this game's collectibles is actually a breeze. The scenery is absolutely gorgeous. The game's environments range from dreary and desolate to bright and beautiful, and all of them are a joy to experience. And unlike other titles on this list, it also does a very good job of keeping you immersed, which further emphasizes how lovely this game's setting is. That's reason number one. And reason number two? Tell me you don't like that. Yeah, I can see why people like this game. With a name like God of War, even people who know nothing about video games would probably assume that this game is full of intense action, and they'd be right. The combat is complex and weighty and feels fantastic, I, I really can't get enough of it. What people wouldn't expect, though, is God of War's outstanding story, a beautiful tale of one of the most violent and socially inept people on the planet and his son, Boy. Atreus serves as an excellent foil to Kratos, who wants his son to learn restraint, but is slowly realizing that he must first accept his own past and the mistakes that he's made if he wants to teach his son to be better. It's a wonderful story with some truly elite voice acting to boot. When combined with everything else, I can absolutely see why many would consider it the best game for PS4, and it makes me very excited to play the sequel. It's Dark Souls in an open world, of course it was going to be good. 
All right, admittedly, there are a few ways that this could have gone off the rails, but honestly, From Software did an excellent job of making it work well. The atmosphere, the enemy design, the slightly clunky but also somehow perfect combat, it's undeniably a Souls game at heart, but they've placed it in an absolutely massive world with limitless attention to detail and an uncountable number of secrets. The one drawback, to me at least, is that not having a set order to fight the bosses in means sometimes out of nowhere you'll just get absolutely dunked on by some enemy that you weren't ready to face yet. But it wouldn't be Dark Souls without a hefty scoop of bullshit, so I mean, I, I guess it checks out? There's really nothing this game skimps out on. It's definitely 2022's Game of the Year. Probably. And now, my Game of the Year. In general, I don't consider myself a fan of RPGs. Most are just too long-winded or complex for me to find enjoyable. I also find anime games too cringy, turn-based combat too bland, and visual novels too boring. So, Persona 5. First of all, is it even legal for a game to have this much style? Like. The amount of style that this game has is frankly criminal. Beautiful cutscenes, flashy presentation, and the soundtrack. Who? The soundtrack. One of the all-time greats, no doubt. It's just bangers front to back. The presentation alone is enough to get Persona 5 on most Game of the Year lists, but it has so much more. The story is outstanding, and the turn-based combat is actually really fun and satisfying. It mixes genres beautifully. Your interactions with characters in the world and your day-to-day -day life will yield rewards and additional mechanics to use in the combat portion of the game. It's brilliant. Persona 5 is truly one of a kind. It's flashy, it's stylish, it's got a guy with a big-ass nose, and despite spending over a hundred hours playing through this game, I still want to play it again. And that's how you know it's good. Well, overall, I'd say this is a pretty solid year for me as far as games played, uh, though there is still quite a bit in my collection that remains to be played, unfortunately. I actually got quite a few ideas as to uh, games I want to start playing for next year, so I guess there's no reason to not go ahead and start working on next year's tier list. Sorry about that. <laughs> I almost said something stupid there.